Abelson. Tim, I am I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fanny fan, girly girl, like all kind of tongue-tied and crazed that you're here. I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you so much for doing this. This is so fun. This is I've been looking forward to it and and uh I hear your praises sung by Metcalf and and Eliza Robbins and Robertson and uh, you know everybody. So I'm I'm glad to be. Well, you know, and we have more in common too. Um, Stephen Bishop, who was so phenomenal uh, in his little scene in in, in Animal House, uh, has done my show a few times and sang the song. And um, was he? Yeah, he was on set with you because Belushi cracks his guitar, right? He was there for a minute. I mean, that was right at the beginning. We shot the the interior and exterior of the Delta House probably the first few days, first week, you know, not even, I don't know if it was a whole week. And and so Stephen might have been there for a, a heartbeat and then gone. And, okay, so I you it shot in Oregon, correct? Is that correct? Yeah, Eugene, Oregon. And so were the students on campus when you guys were shooting? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that was the first hint we had sort of that, for me, that like, wow, this could really, you know, this might be, this might be something because... Belushi, I mean, he would just stop traffic. I mean, oh people would just drop books and stuff. Oh my God, oh my God, it's John Oh my God, Saturday Night Live. Because I think it was the second year Saturday Night Live. Right. And it was a just, you know, everybody was getting a, a, a clue of how brilliant it was, you know, and we'd never seen anything like it on TV. And then here comes John, he's standing right there. And it's like, oh my God, oh my God. So that, I thought, well, this, this can't hurt. Yeah. Um, did he assimilate? Okay, so from what I from what Mark shared with me, um, it was a vehicle for Animal House was a vehicle for Belushi, and and even though he didn't have the largest part, you by far whether you and Peter were definitely the stars of the film. Um, he was very notable, but I heard also that they had considered casting um, Chevy Chase and stuff like in your part. But that oh, yeah. Landis didn't want it to be a Saturday Night Live vehicle. Is that true? That's true. I mean, uh, uh, John Landis wanted as many real actors around John Belushi as he could mm. get <clears throat> because he just wanted it to be not wink, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you know, not laughing at the jokes yourself. He just right. wanted everybody to play it straight. Uh, straight. And and so that was his thing. And, and what happened with... Uh, because Doug Kenny and Harold Ramis and Chris Miller all worked at the Lampoon, the National Lampoon magazine. Right. And they wrote the script for Belushi and Chevy and uh, Harold wanted to play Boone. He wrote oh, it. Oh, they Chevy. wrote it for Chevy. Oh, oh yeah. And uh, I think Dan Aykroyd was supposed to be D-Day. Wait, and, and who wanted to play Boone? Uh, uh, Harold Ramis. Oh, so what happened was um, <laughs> that um, Harold was told he, he's too old. You can't play this. And we're not going to, Landis didn't want him. And <clears throat> uh, Chevy was talked out of doing it because that Landis and Ivan Reitman and um, Maddie Simmons, I think, and, and the producers all went to lunch to try and convince Chevy to do this movie because they needed a movie star. And Chevy was as hot as you could be in L.A. right at the time in Hollywood. Had Chevy so, done movies at that point? No. So no. they wanted to be, everybody wanted him to be their first one. And, and he was uh, the choice between doing Foul Play with Goldie Hawn or Animal House. And Landis said, hey, you know, you don't want to be up there alone with Goldie because just, it'll just be the two of you. And, <laughs> you know, if, if it doesn't work, you're going to blame you. But in our show, you'll be one of a bunch of guys, you know, and, and you won't be standing out that much. So he's he's underselling the part. So he's and, purposefully misdirecting. Yeah. And, and <laughs> Chevy's sitting there with a big cigar going like, I think I'm going to do the Goldie movie. You know? <laughs> and, and certainly it was worth, you know, it was a lot more money, too, because nobody got paid anything for Animal House. Ah, was it? It was an independent. Was it an independent feature? No. It was a universal picture, but yeah. they didn't want to make it. You know, it was like they kept moving the goalposts on us and, you know, if you can make it for two point two million dollars, we'll do it. I mean, you, you couldn't make anything for two point two. So we only had five weeks. We had a TV crew, which was an excellent crew. 
but a TV crew from Universal could just bang, bang, bang. And then also they, in the days of film, <clears throat> you, you usually would print two or three takes, you know, so. That, right. And they said, no, John Landis, you can't, you can only print one. And so John wouldn't cut. He would just, you know, we'd do a take and he'd go, go back and do it again, do it again, be funnier, be funnier, louder, louder. <laughs> And, and so we'd run back in and try it again. And, you know, and with that, how much, how energy. much, Tim, were you, were you play, how much were you guys playing and how much was on the page? It was mostly all on the page. I mean, there, then there would be like in a toga party, we would, you know, like Jamie widows could sh- juggle and Bruce McGill could play his throat. And there, <laughs> there were those little things that people could do. Right. <clears throat> and, um, and those were in there, but mostly everything was pretty much, um, on, on the page, Belushi was the one who got to, to play around. And because and then it was a there was a real insight be, with John Landis, because when we would improvise, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> I remember one time we we're doing something, I think something in the car on the road trip and I was being mean to Flounder. And John said, no, you can't be mean to him. They won't like you. Stop that. Don't do that. And it, so it, what I was doing was kind of funny, but it's. Uh, but it was me, and we you were, were all- very charming with huh. Flounder and, and Tim Hulse. Yes, you were very charming, but and yet the snark absolutely was there one million percent. Yeah, but it was one of those things that uh, I think that was what John Landis brought to the script mm. was we were the good guys, they were the bad guys, and so we had to be we couldn't be too crazy. There was even they added a scene with Eliza Roberts. Roberts um, that uh, wasn't in the original script because after the the Roadhouse, mm-hmm. after we left the the Emily Dickinson, can we dance with your dates? Yes, we left those <laughs> women there. We jumped in the car and got away. <laughs> so we didn't. They didn't want the audience thinking, "Oh my God, they left him in this <laughs> dangerous situation." So they showed them all walking home, alone right. together, right. all being fine. And you know, I kind of liked. I kind of liked Doug. I, think, I forget what his name <laughs> Doug or something. I kind of liked Doug. Ew. <laughs> you no, know, he was kind of cute. Ew. Yeah, yes. yes. So that so was to let the audience know we didn't get them killed. You know, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, it was a pretty interesting bar. Otis Day in the Nights. Wow. Oh my God. So, okay. <clears throat> so, Tim, what made you? I heard, I've, I've heard that you chased that part, that you wanted that part. Now, okay. So, Yours, mine, and ours. I mean, I've known you for a long time. You haven't known me, but I've adored you for a long time. We'll go back and talk about Lucy and Henry Fonda. But sure. what made you chase Animal House? Because here it is. It's this little feature. It's like a, an ensemble cast. What What did you know? Did you read the script and like, no, this is good? Why? It was, yes, I read the script and it was the funniest, most outrageous, <laughs> new, different kind of comedy. Nothing had been, you know, I mean, I had done a couple of comedies before this, sort of, not my parts weren't too funny, which was uh, <clears throat> Divorce uh, American Style with Dick Van Dyke, Debbie Reynolds, Yours, Mine, and Ours oh, yes. with Henry Fonda and Lucille Ball. And then I did a terrible movie called... <laughs> How to Commit Marriage with Bob Hope and Jackie Gleason. So that's the kind of comedies they were making. And here we come along. Here comes this. And I love The Lampoon. This is like five years later. But you bought I, The Lampoon later, didn't you? I did. I did. Oh, well, we right, tried we'll to resuscitate it. We'll get, we'll get we can get to that. But so it was one of those things. And I just wanted to I really wanted to be a part of that. I love The Lampoon. And how my, did you get the how did your agent get the script? I mean, if they wanted Chevy for the part, how did you even get the script? Were they just going to go through the motions and oh yeah, I mean they, they had so many characters to cast. I mean, the right. Delta, the Omega. So they, you know, the script's out there at all the agencies, people are reading it, and you know, it's uh it's going around. And it was much longer than it, it got trimmed as they got closer to production <clears throat> to fit it into a five-week schedule. But um, so I just I it it was a game changer for me. And they did. I had two meetings. I met with a casting director and then I met with the director, didn't read. And my hair was down on my shoulders, you know, and, and it was like, oh, stop. And they said, Landis didn't even want me to come in and read. He said, no, he's a cowboy or a surfer or something. <laughs> he's not preppy. Forget it. He's, <laughs> he's not right for the part. And I had done a movie at Universal. And <clears throat> so I knew some of the executives. And through my agent, we, we, asked the favor to just get me an audition. If they turn me down after I audition, I get it. I, that's okay. But let me take a shot here. You know, I just got to get a shot at this. 
And they said, all right, all right, let him in. Because it was basically cast. They had a New York actor uh, whose name I forget, but they had already cast it more or less. I mean, they sort of oh. had a guy, not Chevy, but they had a guy that they they really liked. And, um, and then I came in and, and since I had just been studying improv for the past year, because I wanted to change my style of acting and technique and so I, I was learning improv and then I walked in and there's Peter Riegert, who was an improv actor. So we both, you know, it was like love at first sight because we knew the games. We knew the games to play and we knew. So it was like we were brothers, you know. And wow. so we really hit it off and the scenes went really well. And when I improvised, he'd improvised back and it was, you know, and we we left them in, in stitches and. Oh. Um, <laughs> I got it. Was that was that shot? Is there did they shoot that in, that? Uh, audition? Do you know? I don't believe so. I, mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it might have been before they used to do that. You mm -hmm. know, it's one of those they just go live in the room. So, was that Peter's style, or did you guys had special chemistry? I mean, it was it was just it was flying off the screen. The two of you. Oh, thanks. Uh, oh, god. But it was written that way. They they were they were you know blood brothers and and the best of friends and. So, and it's it's hard not to love Peter. I mean, he's just one of the most wonderful people. So, um, it was it was a match made in heaven. Oh boy, I'll say. And so had so you to to date, you had not played that kind of smarmy yet charming, sexy older woman, younger. I mean, that was all new for you, right? Yes, I, I had been playing the nice guy next door the, you know it was the most boring thing <laughs> you could imagine and i you know i had been under contract to universal i had done three westerns the virginian uh, bonanza and then a, a season of a show called the quest with kurt russell and and now i got out of that i had a little bit of money and i thought well i really just want to i want to do something i want to shake it up here hmm. and my contention is you sort of run a cycle about every seven years and I had been in seven years of Westerns and now I'd come out of that. And now I was doing like just a quite handsome in the cowboy boots. Well, thank you. Thank you. I mean, there, there's nothing more fun than playing cowboys. But <laughs> so now I just wanted to shake it up and not be <clears throat> this steadfast, tall, true character, you know, just uh, earnest. And so I just, you know, and, and the lampoon was always one of my favorite things. You know, it just. It was so rude and and so, <laughs> so sexist and borderline racist, if not already racist and anti-Semitic at times. You know, it was, but they knew what they were. They knew they were crossing those lines, right. and they did it in such a manner that they, you were in on the joke, and and you know, um, <clears throat> so it was it, it was the perfect fit for me, and I just I fought like crazy to get there. So what's closer to your personality, Tim? So I'm assuming the good guy, the nice guy is, is more who you really are. But is there that side of, is, that, is there a little bit of darkness in there? Oh, yeah. I mean, sure. I think we all have that dark side and that, mm -hmm. you know, and it's always fun to play that. It's always more, it's cathartic and, and sort of, it's it's more like going to your therapist or something because you get it out. You get in touch with all that evil or the, the the dark nature that you have, or you're always hiding, and then it comes out. And then, but it, and then you go, "Wow, okay, that was." <laughs> um, and I, I always think that's that's very healthy. And um, but nothing is harder than comedy. Comedy is the is the that, and I guess the West Wing. I mean, that was that was a trick too. But I always maintain the West Wing was a bit of a comedy too. I, I we're going to talk about that. Uh, we have we have things in common there. So, uh, so at, okay, I I know it had to have been a life changer for you because you'd done you'd worked a lot before, prior to Animal House, but that's when we that's when you came into the that's when your name was like okay now we yeah. know who you are. So in real life, when you move through the world, I'm assuming the work started to change coming at you. We'll talk about that too. But in life. How did your life change after Otter? Uh, um, I did better with the women. Um, I bet you did. <laughs> because they thought that's what that's who I was. So it's easy to, you know, okay, yeah, that's me. Um, and, um, but. Uh, Not that good, though. 
There was the not that good line. We had that from Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> She's always taking a dig. Um, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was just um, it, it, on that birthday, right after shooting Animal House, I, um, I bought a watch, which was a, my birthday is December 31st. So we finished shooting on, on December 6th. I came home. Um, I lived out in Malibu at the time and there was a party on New Year's at, at my house. And um, I bought myself a watch because I said, you know what? I'm going to get serious about this acting. <laughs> you know, I've got this movie that may be good and it's coming out. And I, I, I don't want to be late for appointments and I'm going to take, I'm going to be more responsible. And so that was the biggest change was I bought a watch. So, but at, like how I would imagine once the movie dropped, when that movie dropped, um, it was the days of sex, drugs, rock and roll, craziness. I, I went with my friend. We stood online. We saw the first showing up in the balcony, smoking wow. doobies. And we stayed <laughs> We stayed for two more. We watched it three times the oh same day. Remember the days when you could do that? I love that. And we just and we laughed as hard the third time as we did the first, if not more so. Once that movie dropped, I would imagine the Red Sea parted for you, I, I especially amongst our generation. You know, I, I had a lot of meetings. The thing is, in Hollywood, you get pigeonholed. And I, I mean, mm -hmm. I took I went and met with the head of Paramount. I went and met with, you know, different studio heads and, <clears throat> oh, we'd love, and they say all this, oh yeah, we'd really love to work with you. We, you know, what do you want to do? They just, they just want to see who you are. Right. And, um, but I wasn't the lead. I was one of a group. Well, so, well, I mean, so what they say is, well, he, can he carry a movie? You know I mean? All by himself out there without a group around him. Is he going to be able to do that? So I, I, I and the movies that I did right after that, yeah, I don't, I'm not the, the proudest of. I mean, I career wise, they they weren't. <laughs> I did I did a, a picture called Dreamer, and and it was a what I thought was going to be. It was a guy a, about a guy who became a professional bowler. All right, and um, it was for how did Fox. I miss that <laughs> one? Yeah, that's, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was, I, I had seen a movie called uh, uh, Sporting Life with Richard Harris, which was mm -hmm. a dark indie, you know, English thing about a rugby player. And it was edgy and tough, mm. and it's, you know, almost in black and white, if it wasn't Sporting, Sporting Life with, with Richard life. Harris. And I thought that this, this should be like that. And when, when you're talking to the studio, they went, yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> And it was not. <laughs> and when I saw it uh, at the screening, I looked at it and I went, it's like a TV show. I mean, it's like, oh, it was so disappointing. I mean, it, it's like a sweet movie, okay movie, but it had no edge. Mm -hmm. And for me to come on the heels of Animal House with that, the only one that was I did, because nobody got paid on Animal House, the first film I shot right after Animal House was uh, the Apple Dumpling Gang Rides Again because I needed I needed to pay the rent, so I took right. I took a job over at Disney, and Tim Conway and Don Knotts were in, and and it was that was just delicious and fun mm -hmm. and silly little movie, but you know of course it was the the end of the Disney days. Walt was right, going, you know, and I think Ron Miller was running the studio, which was his son in law, I believe. So it wasn't there was not a lot of artistic stuff going on there at the time. So it, those couple of movies, then I think came 1941, which, which I, oh my God, working <laughs> with Spielberg and working with Belushi again. So did you have, uh, what was your relationship with, with John? La I mean, he was in those crazy days when, when drugs were, so how was he, did he behave on set? Was he, how did that work? <laughs> he behaved on Animal House because I think John Landis sort of spanked him and just said, no, no, you can't do any drugs. You have to stay out. Yeah. Because, because Belushi was only there two and a half days a week. In, right. Cause in, he's flying in, back to do us <clears> now. Wednesday afternoon, he'd be in a car to get to Portland and fly, uh, take a red eye and fly back to New York, rehearse Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday and then shoot Saturday and then go Saturday night live and then get on a plane, wow. come back to us. Um, me and Bruce McGill who played D-Day would often, pick John up at the airport and drive him back to, he had a house with his wife to keep him away from all the craziness <laughs> that was going on back at the roadway Inn where we were all staying. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, so I mean, so that was, but when it, by the time 
John got to 1941, Belushi got to 1941, he was a different guy, you yeah. know? I mean, he was so famous. Yeah. And he, he was the, getting into the Blues Brothers and he was, you know, I mean, it was, he just was a star, no matter what he did, it was gold. It was, yeah. he's a TV star, he's a movie star, he's a record star. And, and it just sort of, it ate him up, I think, you know, and everybody wanted a party with him and it was hard for him to say no. And, and if you recall, you recall, it was probably before your time dabbling, but drugs weren't bad for you. You know, hey, look, I can't believe the cocaine is not bad for you. Wow, oh, no, not heck? before my time. <laughs> <laughs> Very much my time. So it was sad. It was sad to see, you know, in 41, 1941 was such a big movie with so many people that um was he missing was he missing uh call times and stuff like that what i do remember was the first day of shooting <clears throat> first or second first day i believe um nancy allen and i were out uh i think to do a scene in in the airplane but but not inside the airplane outside the airplane at some 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 uh, location way, way out of town. Mm -hmm. And Belushi was going to be doing stuff, running in and getting in and out of the plane and doing stuff in his plane. And there are, he's up first, the sun goes down, they start shooting and then, and he gets out of the, and I, I don't think he was, <clears throat> I think he'd been playing around with some drugs or something or who knows what. And he slipped getting out of the plane and he fell on his head and he hurt himself and they had to take him to the hospital to, to make sure he was okay. And so it was the middle of the night. Nancy and I are, you know, asleep in our trailers and they wake us up and say, OK, you guys are on. <laughs> it's like, what? So the first day you could see that th this could be a problem. And Stephen, I don't even think would not like Landis. Stephen wouldn't get into it with him and, you know, tell him he had to behave or because um, at that point, it's pretty hard to tell tell him to do anything. I think. I mean, he was still lovely. He was lovely to me. and And I spent time with him. And, and when Judy uh, was around, we would all get together and, and have a more down to earth, normal kind of evening. Cause I didn't, I didn't party much because I, I you know, I, I, I'm acting and I'm working right. and I've got to learn my lines. So um, I think that I was helping balance it out, but, but I think part of the time he just go, I oh, know Mathis, forget him. He's not gonna. He's not gonna be any fun. Let's just go over here, you know. And, and there were enough people lined up around the block that he could party with. Was he humble? Was he was he movie star ish on the set, or was he like fun and a regular guy? He was fun and a regular guy, and you know, and Danny Aykroyd was there, and John Candy, and you know, all these wonderful people were there. Um, and that was the other thing about Belushi is that he was so nice to me and so supportive in animal house. And when he could have been a New York, you know, TV star and he got to, you know, Eugene, but he wasn't. And he was very, very supportive of me. He knew this was my first comedy and like any good improv actor, you mm -hmm. always go with your partner, right. whatever your partner right. does. You just, yeah. Okay. I'll use that. And then I'll build on it. And then I'll get back to you, you know, and then let's, right. and, and he, um, <clears throat> He, we still had that affinity and that that kind of connection, um, but he was you, sort of going off, you know, into the the stratosphere. He was nobody was a bigger star than he was at that moment. And how I mean, Spielberg, I, how how was Spielberg? You worked with Spielberg, you worked with John Lennon, you worked with all these amazing directors and have become <clears throat> one yourself. What was that like to work with Spielberg? I mean, did he keep a tight rein on John? Was was he a Lucy Goose? What kind of director was he in at, during 1941? Stephen, well, it, it was a huge movie. Right. It was just enormous. <clears throat> and we have hundreds of extras in period costume. And um, so it was... It, and, and a lot of it was shot at the, any exterior stuff generally was done at night. Mm -hmm. So we, now, you, which is not a good thing on a movie set when you're shooting week after week after week all night and then trying to sleep during the day, <clears throat> you know, if you sure. can. And so you're kind of fried anyway. Um, so, and then sometimes you, I wouldn't work, you know, or, and, and it wouldn't be good for like John Belushi sitting in his trailer for six hours, you know, something, 
something's going to go wrong here. You know, this is, <laughs> you know, at the end of the six hours, he may not be ready to come out, you know? So I, and, but they just basically would have us sitting around and waiting in case Stephen needed us. And, um, and Stephen was the biggest director in the world at the time, you know, oh, he'd just yeah. done close encounters, he'd done jaws and he was uh, huge. I mean, and um, this was a different thing for him. Comedy. It was, it's John Landis's sort of uh, right. wheelhouse, not necessarily Stephen. Stephen has charm and and lovely humor in almost every movie he makes, mm -hmm. but it's generally not laugh out loud funny. Right. Yes. So, how Tim did you avoid? Mm -hmm. You were a product of the. You were a child of the '50s, '60s, like uh, many of us. How did you not? fall into that whole addiction thing. What, well, were, you, were you a straight arrow? Um, you know, I dabbled, but I mean, as a kid, I wasn't that successful. I was what they, I used to joke around called the third kid through the door. You know, I mean, the, 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 the lead guy in the show would go through the door, his best pal would come in and then I'd come in and go, Hey, what's up guys. You know I mean? It was like, on Beaver or My Three Sons or something. And I had these, so I was not a, a, a young star. Then I went and did cartoons where you're invisible. Johnny Quest. You know, Johnny yeah, Quest and young crazy. Sinbad. I worked with the greatest actors, Mel Blanc and Dawes mm. Butler and Don Messick and June Foray and all these incredible performers. And wait, learned so wait, much. Wait, let's stop there for a second. Was that fun or frustrate? Was it a frustration because now you have the lead but they don't, we don't see your face. So was that no, good? It was, it was a whole new world. You know, I had never done it. And it was like, it was a good transition because I had just sort of was growing out of being a kid. I mean, I auditioned for Johnny Quest at 15. I got it. I think we started re uh, recording it at, when I was 16. I remember I could drive to work. Um, <clears throat> and um there wasn't anything else to do. You know I mean? I was sort of in that Netherland. I was not a kid and I was not a young adult yet. And I was trying to make that transition. And what finally helped me, I did cartoons for probably about two years, two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. And then I was put under contract to Universal to be in the Virginian. And so how did you, you straddled TV and film and still do back and forth, back and forth with your whole career. But it wasn't, it wasn't done very much back then. It wasn't as cool as it is now. How no. did you manage? How did you go from the cartoon to, to doing the Virginia? How did that happen? Well, I was still acting, um, you know, taking parts. And I had gotten cast in a, a show was called Adam 12, which was a, a LAPD sure. cop show. And they were, and Adam 12 was their car and they were always driving around and there were a lot of scenes in the car. And my, I had this crazy character who was a Texas kid, hippie Texas kid who had stolen a horse and wanted to ride back to Texas from Hollywood because he was on LSD. And so it, the, <laughs> my whole scene was in the back seat of this car handcuffed and, <laughs> and talking to the two cops in front. And I played it like a Texan, I had a Texas accent. And it was a fun kind of endearing character. And I think they saw that and said, oh, they, they were looking for somebody to put in the Virginia in the next season, younger actor. And so the, I got this offer to go under contract to Universal Studios and they were gonna put me in the Virginia. And it was, it was great. I mean, because I actually, I made decent money. Back then they had these beginner's terms for like $125 a week and they'd put you in little parts and this and that. You know? Really? It was their way of getting around paying Screen Actors Guild minimum. Uh -huh. Now, and I worked so I could get it. I got a decent salary. And this was the first time I was going to get paid for a whole season, a whole year, you know, so I could put money away and, 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 and like, but in the, in the middle of two years, uh, the Virginian changed into a different show called The Men from Shiloh, which I wasn't in. So they put me in a, a, a two hour Western pilot called Block, Stock and Barrel. And then the, and that, that almost sold, didn't sell. And the next year we did Hitched with Sally Field and I in the same story of these two youngsters on the road in the West and like that. That didn't sell. And but 
during that time, I studied and I took fencing classes and Shakespeare classes and, and was, you know, Stanislavski. I was studying anything and everything. I was trying to get my Juilliard education in that two year period. And then in the last year, I was in Bonanza and drove them crazy with my method acting. And uh, <laughs> but, Tim, how did this start? I know you're a Burbank boy. Were your, were your parents uh, showbiz people? I don't know this. No, no. Uh, my parents were divorced. My mother um, was basically working two full-time jobs. She worked during the day. She worked in a uh, lumber company. She was like the executive secretary for the, the, the guy who ran it mm -hmm. and uh, or a construction company. And then she at night would work for the LAPD. She worked uh, as a, uh, in, in the uh, watch commander's office. Uh, you know, she was like one Adam 12, you know, she was always <laughs> on the, on the mic talking to the, the officers in the field and get, you know, and so, and she would juggle. I mean, she worked 16 hours a day. It was well, now how, how old are you when you're my, my parents divorced at nine? I was a latchkey kid. How old were you when you were, when your parents were divorced and you were, that happened, I think I was six or seven, seven years old like that. And so at what point did you say, okay, I want to be an actor? And and what sparked that in you, do you think? Well, I used to go, like you were talking about seeing a movie two or three times in a row. I would do that as a, for solace, you know, to get away from the turmoil and the tumult of my mother and father's arguing about the divorce and whatever. So I'd run to the movie, cost a quarter, I think back then, you know, you'd, and I'd sit there and watch the serials and the, com, the cartoons and then the, the movies and then watch the movie again and again. And it just calmed me down. So I, it was like my place of comfort, you know, and, and I, because it was always the same. I, you know, I'd seen this movie. Now I get to see it again. Nothing's going to change. Whereas <laughs> in my life, it was all down. So I think that's what right. first attracted me to it. And I thought, I want to get in there. I want to be in that world, not this world so much. Do you remember Million Dollar Movie? We could watch the same movie on TV over and over and over. You could yeah. watch it like 15 times in a week. So, okay. So you go to your mother and you say, I, I want to do this. How, how did it happen? She had, she worked for this construction company and the, the guy who was her boss had a kid who was my age. I actually, I actually went to school with him, I think. And um, he had gone up, he, he was dabbling and trying, he'd, got, he'd done a couple of things here and there, commercials and this and that. And so his agent sent him up for a part on a, a new uh, Robert Young series called Window on Main Street, right after Father Knows Best. And um, he didn't get it. So the guy said, why don't you, Sally, my mom, he said, let's, let's get my, the agent to send Tim in on this. And I, I didn't get it, but I got close. And then I got added as a character mid season. And so I started working and I thought I was doing great. I mean, I was, you know, I went from one, I played a one day part, then I got a two day part. And then they added me as a regular in the last six or eight episodes. And then the show got canceled. And I was like, wow, that's over. I mean, I thought, <laughs> Well, I have reached a certain point in my career now. I was carrying a whole half hour episode. It didn't matter. You know, I was back auditioning again. So there was it was hard knocks, you know, I mean, and I fortunately wasn't a successful star of a show that got canceled. And that was there'd be because as a child, you're not equipped to handle a loss like that. I was going to say it was probably better for you. I, I've gotten to meet Paul Peterson and he has that group of actors that he works with mm -hmm. that were all child stars and that ended up yeah. crashing and burning when it ended. And it's, it, it, it's, you just don't have the emotional hardware to, 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 to handle it, you know? And I think it was great for me because so I'm, I'm doing all that. And then, then I'm doing going into voice work and cartoons. And, and I see and are this you being of, taught on the set, Tim, or are you going to school? How, what is your real life like? I am in high school, but I am being taught on the set. I would bring my uh, homework and I would spend three hours every day. I worked with a teacher and a, a welfare worker <clears throat> on the set. And, um, but it was, so I didn't, even I didn't fit in at school. I, they, I, they didn't know what to do with me. They, I wasn't in any clique. You know, I was, 
I, I wasn't hip. I was too short, you know. Oh yeah, but no, I, come on. You were the kid that was on TV that that had a that had to have some gravitas with the kid. No, there wasn't much though. There wasn't much to see. I mean, you know, it was Johnny Quest or some there. Yeah, but that, on, that had to <laughs> lift your your profile. The fact that you no didn't help with the girls. Mean. I did have. <laughs> I did have a, the, the, one of the prettiest girls in school say to me, Janelle Penny said, you know, Tim, you're so funny. If you were six feet tall, I'd go out with you. <laughs> and it was, and I'm like five, six, you know, and it's like, oh, thanks a lot. You know, I mean? <laughs> well, you had the last laugh on that one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so your I don't know if yours, mine and ours was the first thing that broke you. I mean, it's the it's what I remember you first from. How did how did you go from playing the third one in the door to getting that? What, what happened in there? That was a link. There were two two reasons I got that. Um, you had to have a, a draft deferment. That was really important back then. They wouldn't even see you if you didn't have a draft deferment. How did, did you have a deferment? I was in uh, college for a minute. So I had my draft deferment then. And, and, uh, did you that, have a number, I, Tim? Were you part of the lottery? This was before the numbers, but when they finally did come out and I lost my, um, my deferment, I was, I was gone. You know, I would have been gone. And so I was fortunate enough to, to, uh, join the Marine Corps reserves. And I, uh, I served in the Marine Corps reserves. Um, which was six months active duty. And then, you know, up to six years back at your uh, reserve station, which mine was in LA. Um, but it that was, was uh, so, yours, my, so yours, mine and ours was an audition thing. <clears throat> I came up and I kept going in and doing well and doing well. And then I got a screen test. Now was I Lucy tested. a part of this? Cause she was a, was she a producer on that as well? She owned the studio. She was the first female executive in Hollywood. Wow. And, and yeah. we, you know, we were shooting it at Desi Lou, you know. So, um, <clears throat> but what happened was she would come in as a producer. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I, in the screen test, I acted with her. I think I acted with uh, other characters, somebody standing in for Henry Fonda and mm -hmm. <clears throat> doing those kinds of scenes, you know. Um, so, she, but she was a remarkable woman and just. Was she intimidating, Tim? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, my God, it's Lucy. I mean, it was like yeah. you get up close to her. And I must say the first day we were shooting, I, I saw her coming out of her, her dressing room over on Desi Lou, and she did not have red hair. She wore this big red wig and she had red eyebrows that were late, you know, lace eyebrows. They were, they put on over her eyebrows and she had lipstick that went way outside of her lips. I mean, yeah. and, and it's like, holy crap, it's like Lucy, but it's like when you get close to Santa Claus, you sort of go, whoa. And it was, you know, um, but she knew exactly what she was doing at all times. Mm. And I must say, it, I learned so much and she was very generous and gracious to me. And I remember First time I came up, I'd been cast and I came up to her office at Desi Lou, the executive, you know, runs the studio. That's her. And she came out and said, you know, congratulations. She did a wonderful job. And with that, we love having you in the picture. She was so sweet. She could be very tough. Once you got to the set, you better, better get your, your shit together. You know, I mean, she was remarkable. Um, she didn't care if you were three or 33, you, you better know your lines. You better hit wow. your marks, you better spit it out and better do it quick because she could, so it's big, broad comedy, but it's always better in a master. Oftentimes, if you look at like the drunk sequence she does in that movie, she's remarkable. And it's like, I remember watching it and she was like, <clears throat> How's she going to do this? She's crying. She's laughing. She's crying. She's spilling milk. She's dropping mashed potatoes on this girl's lap. And then she's, you know, it's, she, it's nuts. She was brilliant. She's oh, just wow. brilliant. And then, you know, we did this one take, the first take, and, and everybody was like, oh, my God, the, audit, the, the crew burst into applause. And, and the director said, well, well, that was awesome, Lucy, just fantastic. 
um, you should just print it, move on. And, and she, she looked at me and she, 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 and she kind of winked and she said, let's do it again. I can do it better. And it was like, wow. Okay. And did she? Oh yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you could, when you watched her set up her place around the table, she put the glass of milk that she had to knock down directly in line with where she was reaching for something so that the milk went over every time she was precise. Mm -hmm. And then I think at another point during that sequence, she looked at me and said, always rehearse with your props. <laughs> and, and I, okay, Lucy. Yeah. And, I, but I got it when I, you know, started doing larger parts in comedies. If you're doing physical comedy, you have to set everything. You can't just get lucky or start thinking, how am I going to knock over the thing? And how, you know, it just has wow. to be part of the rhythm of what you're doing. And she, you learned from nobody the master. Did that, you know? Wow. And so, yeah. and I imagine Henry Fonda was a very different experience on that set. Yes. Henry was straight as a string. He was like the old time movie stars, like <clears throat> Spencer Tracy always said, what's acting? He said, walk in the room, hit your mark, look him in the eye and tell the truth, you know, and that's, that's Henry, you know, uh, and during this big scene where Lucy's, you know, going drunk and, and laughing and doing all this, well, cause we've spiked her drink and gotten her drunk. And right. uh, Henry was just straight as a string. He was just, you know, he didn't over, he didn't hand bone it up. He's not trying to do what Lucy was doing. He just was very simple and, I just re remember looking at Henry going, that's a movie star. He just, mm. he just look in those eyes and he's getting it all, but he's hardly doing it, anything, you know? And it was, oh, it, was, it was incredible. And so even back then you're, you're going back and forth between TV and film. You did a, you did a, a, a television show with Kurt Russell, you guys. What was that like? <laughs> well, Kurt was, like, like in MASH, he's one of the pros from Dover. You know, he's, he had done everything since he was a kid. Right. He was and a he, had learned, he had learned so much about acting that, and I was, this was my first big shot, you know, to be in a series and uh, carry a series. And, and I was taking acting classes and I was working really hard. And, he, and, and you know, I'd start playing the scene in the rehearsals, the blocking rehearsals way before the camera even shows up. And he looked at me one day and he said, you know, you got to just take it easy because you're going to burn yourself out. Wow. If you, you know, just walk through those first rehearsals, save it for when the camera rolls and then you'll have it fresh. And I was like, oh, OK. You know, I mean, he, he always would put things in perspective, not necessarily, you know, because he looked at he looked at acting like he looked at baseball and he was a baseball player, he was a pro baseball player. Mm -hmm. And he looked at it like you look at hitting you know, it's a science. You got to, you, you got to, you know, and, and, and you do it a certain way and got to know what kind of pitch is coming. And if it's whether I should swing, whether I shouldn't swing or how do you take a grounder to second base or what? That's the way he looked at acting. And, and he also kept it very light. So I got away from all the, the heavy Stanislavski method -y kind of in, you know, and just try to have more fun, fun you know, yeah. right after that's when I went into Animal House, you know. So it sounds like you were kind of a sponge. I love the fact that you have oh, <clears throat> that you always studied and that you kept doing that and you took your craft so seriously. It also sounds like you really paid attention to the people on the set and allowed them to mentor you. At, at what point, so you're paying attention. When do you start to think, director, oh, look what he's doing. That's something I might want to do one day. Like, when did that bug hit you? You know, you always, I was always looking and talking to directors and, and I was, I, I made movies as a kid and, you know, I shot them on my eight millimeter camera. Um, and I think what happened was um, I produced a movie. I got the, the rights to a series of films, the most successful series of films in Japan at the time called Zatoichi. And Zatoichi was the blind samurai swordsman. And it was a comedy drama. Wow. And it was, there was 25 of the movies and they did a hundred episodes of a TV series. And, and a guy named Shintaro Katsu was the star of it, who was just the most beloved character in Japan. And he was silly, 
blind guy. People were always stealing from him, but he could hear. And then they'd do a shot of his ear and his ear would kind of like move. And, and he could hear better than we can see. So you couldn't pull anything over on him. And he had inside of his blind man's cane, he had a sword, a samurai sword. So, and nobody knew it was there, but when he was, he was always a character that would help and save the disadvantaged and, and, you know, people who were being exploited or, 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 you know, were innocents. And so I bought the rights and I said, we're going to make an American movie out of this. And, and, you know, and if we do this right, it'll be a series that'll go on. <clears throat> we can make 10 of these. And we hired a director who was an Australian director and he wouldn't look at the original movies in, from Japan. He wouldn't listen to just, I said, you know, if we, our movies as good as any of those, we'll do 10 of these. It's, an, it's, it's a but. He wouldn't look at it. He wouldn't let the, the actor look at it. It was Rector Hauer. And oh, so wow. the result was anything but a successful movie. I mean, it's kind of, it's a cute movie, but it's not anywhere near as sweet and, and endearing as the Zatoichi movie. So after that experience, I thought, well, listen, if I'm going down in flames, I might as well drive. I might as well be at the, the <laughs> you helm might the well be driving. You know, let me fly the plane. What the hell? And so it was then I got more and more interested in it. And, uh, yeah. And, and was your and you, first directing gig, if I'm not wrong, was it a scene elsewhere? Our good friend Ed yes. Bailey on that show. And how did you, so how yeah. did you, how do you score your first, how does somebody open that door and give you that first shot? There was a wonderful guy um, named Bruce Paltrow, who is uh, sure. uh, Gwyneth's Gwyneth's father, mm -hmm. And he created St. Elsewhere, <clears throat> was a writer, director. He, um, I had done a movie called A Little Sex that he had directed mm -hmm. that I'd started with Kate Capshaw. And um, I told Bruce I wanted to do it. I was always hanging around the set at St. Elsewhere. A friend of mine was the AD. And he said, all right, you can do one of these, you know. And I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I had, and, and Bruce was so funny because, like, I remember the first day I'm shooting a scene in a locker room. And I just, you know, and it's like, okay cut we shoot it and cut and uh i said print that and everybody and the whole crew looks at me and went oh you gotta be kidding and turned and walked away leaving me alone on it and i was like oh my god and then they all started laughing because bruce had put him up to it you know? <laughs> so i mean but that was bruce paltrow he was he was a gem he was he was very very supportive of me and he taught me how much I really didn't know about directing, but was encouraging, you know, and you learn a little bit on every show and um, and and you learn what you're not good at by doing it, because all of a sudden you get in like like action. I remember doing an action movie for USA or something and it was a terribly good movie, but I had, you know, I, I did my shot list and I had planned everything I was going to do. And, and, and you only have so much time to do it in. Mm -hmm. Action takes twice as long. That's the lesson I learned on that movie. Oh, because wow. you got to talk it out. You got to see, you got to predict there's this, there's a gun on the set. You got to let me see the gun. I want to make sure it's empty. You got to, okay, there's going to be a car screaming in here. Right, it stops it's very here. Visual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it just, it's for safety. You have to mm -hmm. make sure that <clears throat> nothing goes wrong. Or if it does go wrong, you know what to do. So you have to have safety meetings and stuff. So it takes a great deal of time. And that was what I learned. And then if you don't have enough time to shoot it, now you're in the editing room, you don't have enough footage. So you're in trouble. Oh. <laughs> and yeah, so, I, I learned the hard way. And so what was the first time you you directed <clears throat> yourself and you were also a, an, an actor? Because that has to be a whole nother trip. <clears throat> I, it was this movie, I think, shot in Toronto. It was called... Heads your heads you lived, tails you're dead, or something like that. Head, no, yeah, I, I forget that it was, but it was it was a um, it was a you know a, a caper movie. There was a bad guy chasing the good guy around, and <clears throat> I think it, Corbin Berenson was in it, mm. and um, and I was always very prepared. I mean, I do diagrams where the cameras would be, and I mean, I was really really very efficient. But it was one of those. It was such a cheap show that the producer would say um 
I, I said, oh, I need to wet down the streets. We're shooting at night. We want to see the lights bouncing off the street. So I need, what you did was a water truck and you'd run the water truck through and then you'd shoot the scene. And it's just an old trick to make it more dynamic and exciting, you know? Right. And he said, yeah, yeah, we'll get there. We'll, get, we'll, we'll wet it down for you. And we get there. I said, well, where's the wet down? And he said, I never said anything about a wet down. So this guy was constantly promising everything. And he said, but, you know, no, we don't have the money for that. Are you crazy? So it was, you know, it was learning it the hard way. And and I don't think the water and the wet down would have helped one bit. But I mean, you know, it was, like, it was one of those things. I wanted it, you know, what the heck? Uh, okay, so I'm going to, fa- you know, I... Tim, I so appreciate you doing this today. I know that you have a very busy day. You're doing a read through for Thank you. the Thank next you. season of Virgin River, which we'll get to in a minute. And and you have another meeting, and and yet you honored this. And and I know, and you're drinking tea, and I know you're keeping your voice. And anyway, grateful, grateful, and Thank so you. grateful to Mark Metcalf. Thank you so much for connecting me with Tim. Childhood dream come true. Thank you, Mark. Childhood. I was I was not a child. <clears throat> I was a peer, but still, it feels like I've known you forever. Um, but anyway, I want to fast forward because there's a few things I want to get to, and then I want to let you go so you can rest before your next meeting. Thank you. Um, so the West Wing, we have to talk about the West Wing. And as I mentioned to you uh, before we came on the air, my beau was the composer on that show. So I, we, it's and, so, so how did you get the West Wing? I mean, that was arguably arguably will go down as one of the greatest television shows that has ever been. absolutely how, no, ab- you're how absolutely right. did you fight for that did they hand <clears> it to you how did that come to you i saw that well I, I i lived in santa barbara and my son was playing t-ball and also playing t-ball was rob lowe and his his son uh-huh. and i knew him slightly from around and <clears throat> some fundraisers he came to a, my house for a fundraiser for um Friends of the river, because I was into protecting, you know, the the the, um, the rivers in in California, and he said, "Oh yeah, I did this pilot uh, for Warner Brothers called The West Wing," and I said, "Huh, what's it? So it's about what do you say? No, it's about the, the staff that works with the president of the United States." And I thought, "Oh my God, that you know, I didn't say this, but I thought, oh geez, that sounds dreadful. <laughs> this is going to last fifteen minutes. This is not going to be." Fun. <laughs> fade out, fade in. I get a call from my agents and agents are always trying to protect you. And so he said, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, they want you to come in for the West Wing and, and meet Aaron for this part. And but we don't think you should go. We think it should be an offer only. And that's what agents do. They try and go to the studio and they go, no, no, no. Tim's not coming in. You got to offer it to him and try and get an offer that they can bring to you. And right. say, okay. so I said, well, and I loved Aaron Sorkin. I mean, um, what is it? Sports night he had done. And it was, mm-hmm. you know, he, I, I just loved his style of shooting with Tommy Shlomi and the two of them doing this. And I read the script and it was like brilliant. And so I said, is anybody getting parts here with that don't, don't audition? And they said, well, no. And I said, I'm going in, let's go. I'm, you know, I hadn't auditioned for stuff in, in a while, but because I was at a stature, I was at a point where I yes. just did awesome stuff. So I said, Hey, you know, I got no false pride. I'll do it. So I go in and I meet and Aaron's there and Tommy's there and, and uh, we chat and, and we talk. And, and he said, the, he gave me the key to the character. He said, he likes to play golf a lot, this guy, you know, he's, <laughs> he's just out there playing golf a lot with that, you know, um, and he, he is a politician and he thinks he should be president. He, this, this Jed Bartlett, no friggin' way should this guy be anywhere near the, the Oval Office. It's, it's me. I've earned it. I'm a smart guy. And uh, I'm a good politician. And he sort of saw a little bit, I think, of Eric Stratton, the Rush chairman from Animal House, in this guy. I was just, just going to say, he sounds right? like a grown-up otter. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think. And so I, we had a, just a fun time. And I kept it light. And he was light. And I walked out and got in a car and I was driving back to Santa Barbara. And by the time I got halfway home, I got a call said, you got the part. And the, but, and it was such a treat. And then Aaron, I remember the first read through, um, we hadn't even opened because you couldn't get the script before the read through. You'd open it there because Aaron just guarded this thing carefully. And and here's the script. And he said, Tim, your, your first scene is going to be in French. 
And I said, what? yeah, right. <laughs> and, and he said, no, I'm not kidding. You're in, you'll be talking to French reporters and you'll be speaking French. Do you speak French? And I said, a little, a little bit. I, yeah, well, I think I can do that. And he goes, good, good. That's the way it's going to be. <laughs> but I mean, he'd always raise the bar wow. and throw a curve and, and give you stuff. But you had to do everything exactly as written. Mm. Couldn't add a word, couldn't leave a word out or he'll shoot it again. And I remember the script supervisor coming up to me after one take and she goes, it is a semicolon, not a period. Oh my gosh. Went, wow. Got it. Okay. Got it. Wow. Because he's from the theater and, you know, he was a big Well, he's a stuff. wordsmith up down sideways. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and there's a rhythm to his, yes. his, his prose, you know, and, and if you throw stuff in or you just, you don't keep the rhythm going. That's why I always, when I looked at the first few scripts and the readings, I said, this is like His Girl Friday. You know, this is like mm. a, a, a Howard Hawks movie that's just bang, 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 bang. Fast, fast, fast. And these people are real smart. They talk fast. And, they, and so you've got to know exactly what the words are if you're going to go that fast. Was it and, stressful, Tim? Because you're all rapid fire. Everybody's talking over each other. Like <clears throat> once the cameras started rolling, it had to be kind of frantic, a little frenetic, right? Um, well, yes, it, it, it's interesting you say that because I wasn't a regular. I'm, I'm there like six, seven, eight shows a season. And so I'm gone for two months and I come back and I do an episode and I go back, you know, and then I do whatever else I'm doing. <clears throat> I, that first day on the set was like, oh, my God, because I'd seen actors melt down on the West Wing because they didn't learn their lines and, and they got nothing but trouble because, I mean, and, and nobody is throwing you a life. Uh, preserve or anything so um it, it was tricky it was very tricky and and i think fortunately i remember i was having a rough morning or it was i was very very nervous and, and my first scene was with john spencer and uh, leo oh, mccarry an actor the, the most wonderful wonderful man and actor mm. i've known in a long time and i would just look at him and listen to him and be so grounded because he was so good and so real mm. that all my nerves went away, you know? So even Martin, if I'm in an Oval Office. How about Martin Sheen? What was that experience like? Well, Martin, you know, he's a consummate actor and a mm. very, very sweet man. Um, <clears throat> and, and a legend. I mean, you know, Apocalypse Now and all, you know, all the things he's done. Um, Martin was challenged by the dialogue and oftentimes didn't get it right, but he was, <clears throat> he owned that. He would just go, ah, oh, guys, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Let me do it again. Let me do it again. And then he would, he, and then he'd get it. He'd find the rhythm and then he'd hit it, you know, and he had his own technique and it took him a couple of takes to get in on sometimes, not always, but it took him a couple of takes to get what the scene's about and what's going boom. And then he'd nail it, you know, I mean, he, and, and he, oh, so, so emotional, but he kept it, you know, inside. And so he was just, uh, everybody on that set, Alice and Janney, Brad Whitford, uh, Richard Schiff, they were all so good. And, mm -hmm. you know, that every time I'd get a different scene, I go, now I got a scene with Richard Schiff. Now I got a scene with Rob. Now I've got a scene with Brad Whitford, you know, and, and it was just like a kid in a candy store. I mean, I, it, wow. It's so good. I mean, geez. And you're working with people that are just the best in the business. It makes you better. Do you have a trick, Tim? I mean, okay, we're getting to a certain age. How the hell do you still learn lines? Do you do you have a a method or what do you do? How do you do well, it? It, I, it? I don't learn lines because it's it's thoughts. And if, mm. if you have you sequence the thoughts and the sort of objective that I want, I want it, you know, I want you to loan me money. So I I know what I'm talking about. So right. I, you know, I've said, now, I, have you seen my car outside? I've got this great car that's worth a lot of money. And I'd like to give it to you to hold for three months if you can give me $50,000. You know, so I mean, so it's it's not the words. It's But with Sorkin, it is the words, though, right? But you have to craft those into yes. thoughts, I mm -hmm. think. But but no, you're absolutely right. His, his It was a little tougher, <laughs> a little tougher at times. Mm -hmm. All right, because so, he's talking about 
arcane stuff like you know bill 1463 some crazy names yeah. and, like, and it's like an i don't you know those you really just you better phonetically work that out mm -hmm. you know so tim we have to get to virgin river i i wanted to talk about this is us peter onorati a good friend of mine uh, quickly this is us was that was that a, a fun <clears throat> experience for you i loved it yeah i mean that, <clears throat> that was a show that had it was in many ways reminded me of the West Wing in the sense that <clears throat> they were wonderful, wonderful performers, writers and directors, all together, all with of the same mind. And they all knew what that show was and and would only give it their best, you know, and they brought it. And no one came to the set unprepared. Um, <clears throat> it was it was just great, you know, and uh, and, and they couldn't have been nicer and uh, more generous and more fun. Uh, okay, so Virgin River, here we are. So I found you because Eliza Roberts was on the show with her husband, Eric, and I was asking her what to binge because we were in the middle of a pandemic. And without skipping a beach, Virgin River, you've got to watch Virgin River. And, you know, I forgot you guys had the connection from Animal House, which she adores yeah. you. So when you started Virgin River, it was pre-pandemic, correct? Yes. Okay, so how... Yeah. Had you shot two, one season, two seasons? How many had you shot pre-pandemic? We'd shot two seasons. And then during our hiatus, the pandemic hit. And then it was like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Can we go up and shoot? Can we get up there? And, and um, how can we travel? Nobody had any vaccines at that point. And we were like the canary in the coal mine. We were the first show back up. Wow. Here in Vancouver, you know. So how was it for you? I mean, I was telling you before the show, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm not kind of, I'm COVID crazy. And the people who watch my, my tens of fans, COVID crazies. Um, how were you and Elizabeth uh, during the, the early pandemic? Mm. Were you careful? Were you, what was your life like when it started? Did, did work stop for you? Did you have things on the books? What, what happened? I had nothing on the books except Virgin River. Elizabeth was doing a series. I think it was the good girls and she's a script supervisor, my wife. And she, um, they came on the set and said, uh, okay, the end of everybody grab every, all your gear and we're closing down, take it home. We don't know when we'll be back up. And they hadn't finished the show. They had the episode. They had, you know, so just we were going to pick this up when we can, but it's not safe any longer. And um, <clears throat> so just go home. And so, you know, she came home and, and then we didn't know quite what was going to happen. And then Netflix contacted us all and said, here's here's the plan. We're going to go up there and shoot it. But we're going to, you know, and I think then all the unions and uh, the guilds had come up with a safety protocol, wearing masks and whatever, but nobody knew anything, you know, and, and. Um, were you I afraid? Remember, were you afraid to travel? Were you, were you afraid to be on a set or were you fearless? Well, it was a calculated risk. They, mm -hmm. the nice thing was Netflix sent us up in a G5 private jet that they had. And it was like, wow, this is nice. I mean, so we didn't have to get, you know, through a, an airport and do, right. so that was great. And then uh, we quarantined up here in Canada for two weeks to make sure we didn't carry, you know, the, the virus. Mm -hmm. And then um, they tested us like every day and they tested everybody every day. Right. And, but and then I would come in. I put it off as long as I could to get to the set until they were ready. Come in. We rehearsed it take my mask off, shoot it. And then I'd put my mask on and leave. So Did it was, you ever I was get very, shut down very because somebody got COVID. Were you ever shut down no. during the filming? No. Wow. Yeah. We were very fortunate. We were very, and, and we were a few people, I think deep, you know, in the crew, maybe a truck driver or something, somebody came down with it, but nobody ever close to camera or on the set. <clears throat> so we were very fortunate. None of the actors got sick and, um, it you know it kind of bonded us because here we were doing something that we cared about and the, the wonderful thing happened is we 
we at the end of the season, at the end of the third season, and we just that we're shooting the last episode, the last few scenes, they just came out with um, um, COVID testing is here. Okay. Uh, they just came out with. Boy, is that apropos? Yes, they, it just came out um, um, with the ratings, and we were number one around the world. And it was remarkable, you know, and it, we were all there together as actors and crew to share that moment. And Aww. it just, it made that year very special for all of us. And it, it, it made it uh, very rewarding and, and, and created a bond between us all that we, we have to this day. It, it's such a perfect COVID. It was such a perfect pandemic Right. Hinge. I mean, I, I, I came to it uh, just as season three dropped. So I got to watch one, two and three. I don't think I turned the TV off. I just watched right through. And it oh. was just such uh, I'm in the middle of uh, season four now and just loving it. Thank you so much for Thank just you, uh, Vicky. and and I appreciate this. I know you got to go COVID test, but hopefully you'll come back and talk to us again. I so enjoyed I'd love this. To. I will. I will. Thank you so much. I, I enjoyed speaking with you. Have a wonderful day.